I'm Carol Morgan. For those in the Newfoundland that don't know me, I'm president of the Historical Society. Welcome to History at High Noon for this month of March 2023. I started saying that, decided after Johnny and I started looking at all the CDs and we had to figure out what year it was. So I'm prefacing the statements. Uh, welcome. Today we're going to be doing a tribute to a lady that probably saved this museum. And we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, if you are, if you go to Coffee County, days gone by, you will see a notice from me that the Coffee County Georgia Historical Society webpage that the city manages will no longer be getting information from us to to post. In June, on June first, we will be having a new website. But from now until June first, go to Coffee County Days Gone By and you will find information from the museum. We are disassociating ourselves. Wasn't that nice? I did that so well. You will be able to see these clips from this program and the rest of them on dctv3.tv. I did it right, yes. Um, and soon it will be on the Coffee County Days Gone By and the new Historical Society of Coffee County, Georgia. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you look for things. Um, I've got some things to, to tell you about for April that are happening. Number one is Munch and Music at uh, Emma Ward Park. It's a wonderful event. Uh, Bethel, I think it's Family Worship Center is the name of it. Their praise team will be singing the first uh, Wednesday and I have a list and handouts up there if you'd like to see the rest of them and in my favorite time of this year is when the Methodist Church does the Easter week services Holy Week well I call it the Easter week because it is a Holy Week but anyway uh, have a different pastor every day and it's just well, I've always enjoyed it immensely it's so much there's so much diversity but similarities in our county. It's a really pleasure to see all that. Uh, does anybody else have a comment they want to make for the good or social events of our lives? Okay, if not, we'll get started. And a little background. In 2013, Chris Trowell convinced me to be president of the Historical Society. And like you've heard me say many times, it's like the Supreme Court. I guess I'll be here till I die. Uh, and in 2014, we took over the museum, cleaned it up, opened it up, staffed it with volunteers, and decided to do interview programs. Well, those of you who know me know I do not like to be micromanaged. I will balk at you and chew off the leash and bite you on the leg. So, in the early part of 2015, Mary Clyde Scott called me and she said, I want you to come see me. I've got something for you. So I went. She handed me all of the records for the book on Gaskin Avenue. This is going to be emotional. And she said, I trust you to keep it. She gave us all the books. She transferred all the money to the Coffee County Historical Society and we still have that money safe but she wanted it where it could be saved and used again if needed. And she said, what are you doing now? And so we started talking. I've known her all my life, but not closely. And so I went, I'd go by and see her about every three months, ask her questions, because she and Elias Lott were the only ones that knew the answers. And I went to her one month and I said, I'm thinking about doing a program where we interview people about historical things in Coffee County. Oh, that's wonderful. I, do you think, I said, you think it's a good idea? She said, I do. I think it's the best idea you've ever had. I said, well, the good, because the first three months, you're going to be my guest. <laughs> and she said, I'll be delighted. And ever since then, we were friends. I mean, close friends. And one time when I was being micromanaged, I complained to her. She said, tell them to leave you alone or take the keys. I did that very same thing. I told them in a little bit different language that they could have these keys 
or they could leave me alone. I'm still here. <laughs> so it worked. But Mary Clyde was one of the sweetest, nicest, gentle ladies I have ever known. A true Southern lady in every sense of the word. I never, I only heard her say one unkind word about one person. And uh, she had been married to him. So I, I thought, well, maybe she knows what she's talking about. So uh, it was just, she, she was always, and no matter, I would call her, and she said, well, come by and we'll talk about it. And she'd come up here any time I asked her to. Sometimes I'd pick her up if her sitter was, didn't want to come or whatever. We just had a good time together, and her interviews are wonderful. I don't know if y'all remember The Wizard of Oz, but you know in the scene where the man is behind the curtain and he says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the crazy woman interviewing Mary Clyde Scott. Ignore her as best as you can because if there's one thing I hate is me and my voice on video. That's why I have never seen these before. I had never seen this until Johnny brought it to me the other day. I do not watch them. Do not. So we're going to start today. This is from 2015, and she's talking about downtown Douglas. And I thought I had remembered everything, but I was over there the other day taking notes because it just had slipped my mind. She was a wealth of information we will have lost forever, and it's terribly, terribly sad. Johnny, if you'll start it. so excited about this next guest. I hope that when I reach 70 that I will have as much a memory and a mind as sharp as hers and that I can tell everybody about it. Well, I'm not 70, I'm 93. <laughs> I was being kind. Mary Klein Scott is here today to talk to us about Douglas yes. and she is going to be coming every month for several months because I hogtied her into doing this. And we're going to discuss different aspects of Douglas history and the things and the old buildings and that kind of stuff. Um, like she said, she's over 70, so <laughs> she was here for a while. So, what are we going to talk about today? Where well, are we going to start? Today I thought I would tell you something about the hospitals of Douglas and the uh, early doctors. Oh, fantastic. Here. Yeah. So old Dr. Sibbett was probably one of the first doctors to come to Douglas. And old Dr. Sibbett, uh, his wife was Amanda Graham, and he came from North Carolina. They went first to Hazelhurst and then to Broxton. Oh. And then when we got the train, I guess he decided Douglas was going to grow a little bit. So he came over here in the early 1890s. And so after he got here, he and Miss Amanda built a beautiful home on Gaskin Avenue, and that would have been in the late 1890s. Mm -hmm. And the location of the home was where the present Baptist Church is now located. Oh. They tore down that home in order to build the Baptist Church. And the home was a beautiful southern home, a two-story home with wraparound porches on the first and second floor, with the balusters going all the way around the front and down both sides. Mm. And near the back of the church, of the uh, house was a set of stairs that led to the second floor where you could come up the floor, that to the second floor, and that's where Dr. Sibbett had his office. Upstairs in his house. Yeah, upstairs in his house, so he didn't have to even leave. <laughs> and old Dr. Sibbett was our second mayor. Oh. Our first mayor was elected uh, after we were chartered as a town and the first mayor was Calvin Ward, mm -hmm. elected for 1895 and 1896. I remember that name. And then <laughs> after that, uh, Dr. Sibbett was elected for 1896 and 1897 term. Oh. Yes. And so um, my mother told me a lot of stories about Dr. Sibbett. Uh, she was a child in Douglas. They, she moved here from Valdosta when she was just a little girl. And my mother said that uh, old Dr. Sibbett had the first car of anybody in Douglas. 
and she said it would look just like a buggy, that it had no top to it, it was open air, and said it had two, four tall tires all the way around it, and that it went so slow down the street so all the children ran behind it hollering, get a horse, get a horse. <laughs> so he would go chugging down the road in the car. And she said one day he got it in reverse and he couldn't get it out. And he went back and down the road and down the road and said that just delighted the children. <laughs> They'd run behind him hollering and yelling and everybody in the houses came out to see what was the matter. So that was Dr. Sibbett and his first uh, tale about his thing. Uh, and some of the other uh, doctors that we had was Dr. Welchel. Uh, Dr. Welchel was a baby doctor. Now, he didn't really have formal training, but all uh, the ladies in Douglas who had children decided that Dr. Welchel was the best doctor to take your child to. So he got the <laughs> reputation of being the baby doctor. And uh, then we have a Dr. Terrell who was married to Miss Ada Slater's uh, sister. sister. And Miss Ada uh, had four sisters. And at one time, all five of those sisters lived on Gaskin Avenue. Amazing. She was a Clements before mm -hmm. she married um, uh, uh, first time. And then the second marriage was to Mr. Slater. Well, um, that sort of sums up the story of Dr. Sibbett. Well, what happened with the cars? Were there a lot of strange <laughs> things about cars? Well, uh, in January of 1916, Douglas City passed an ordinance regulating the use of cars in the city limits. And one of the regulations said that the car could not go over 10 miles an hour within the city <laughs> limits of Douglas. And when it approached an intersection, then the car must slow down to eight miles an hour. And if there was a horse and rider, or a wagon with uh, mules, or any other animal there at the intersection, then the car must come to a complete stop, and the horse and wagon, and so on, had the right of way Amazing. over the man. Amazing. <laughs> so that was the, the questions. What about the hospitals? Well, the hospitals in Douglas, uh, let's see, first hospital that I know about, uh, and I'm sure that it was the first one, was that beautiful building that's annexed onto the back of the courthouse. It's the building with the beautiful columns. Yes, I and love And it's that right building. there on Ward Street, mm -hmm. a beautiful building. Right by Danny's. That's right. <laughs> and if you look down the sides of that building, you'll see those little small windows mm -hmm. that indicate the patient room all the way down there. And that building was built and completed in 1910, about September of 1910, at a cost of $18,000. Wow. The building itself was 11000 The uh, lot that he was built on mm -hmm. was 4000 and the equipment for the hospital, including all of the operating equipment, was $3,000. So the total Gosh. was $18,000 for that beautiful first hospital that we had. It's a gorgeous building. <laughs> yes. Gorgeous. And there's quite a nice story about one of the doctors okay. that came to, um, was in the hospital there as a doctor, and that was Dr. Roberts, Dr. Wesley Roberts. Mm -hmm. He came from the Roberts family down at Nichols, and it was quite a wealthy family because they were a big farm family, and lots of children, they were all farmers. But Wesley decided he didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> he would like to be a doctor, and not just a doctor, he would like to be a surgeon. Ah. And so one day he got on his horse and rode his horse to Douglas and came to the Citizens Bank where my grandfather, Mr. Barry Hampton Taylor, mm -hmm. was president of the bank. And he came in to talk to him about borrowing money to go to school. And he told Granddaddy that he wanted to go to John Hopkins University to get his education, and he wanted to be a doctor. Well, Grandpa very often loaned money to some of the younger ones in town that wanted to go off to be lawyers and so forth. But he always told them that the condition was that they had to come back to Douglas to practice. And in that way, he was built up yep. the town. So Dr. Roberts pr promised to come back to Douglas to practice. And Grandfather told him that if he would come back to practice, 
that he would get some more men together and they would build him the finest hospital that there was anywhere. Okay. And so that's how the hospital came to be built Amazing. right there in that place. And so Dr. Roberts did come back to practice and practiced here for quite a few years. And I, I think that um, the hospital was not here in 1920, mm -hmm. but I don't know, it started in 1910, and then by 1920, they had closed that hospital, and Dr. Roberts had gone to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, everybody that got sick or had something wrong with them or needed an operation got on the train and went to Atlanta to see Dr. Roberts because they thought he was the finest doctor that there was anywhere. And I don't know exactly when it closed, but I know it was closed by 1920. Wonder why it closed? Well, it closed because Douglas really was not big enough to support a hospital with that many rooms and that much charges and so forth. And so I, I'm sure Dr. Look Roberts... Look at us now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what about other hospitals? Well, the next hospital that I know about was in my house on North Madison Avenue. Do you know where Be Becky's Antiques is? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the next hospital was located. I did not know that. That's right. Uh, I'm, wrong, I'm wrong about that. The second hospital was in the, the um, uh, building where Sid Cottingham was. Oh, okay. And where Sid's office uh -huh. Eve's uh, dress shop is down in the bottom, mm -hmm. of course, from, from uh, Norris Schuster. Okay. That was the second one. And the reason I know that it was the second one was because it was in existence in 1925 and 26. My sister and I had our tonsils taken out there. In that building? And Mama said I was about five years old, so that would have made it 1926. Now, I don't know if it was on the third floor. I want the second floor or the third floor. Mm -hmm. But that was where the hospital was located. And then the next one was the house that I was telling oh, you about Madison. that was there. Then the third hospital was the one that they built out on uh, Ward Street, West Ward Street. Mm -hmm. And that lasted for quite a long time. But finally, uh, Douglas grew so until they felt like that they needed uh, more space mm -hmm. and there was no space to expand and there was no parking room out there. That's right. And so they built the next hospital where the present one mm -hmm. is now. And after a time, as you know, that one was torn down and the new hospital built. So the hospital that's there now is actually the seventh in hospital Douglas. in Douglas. Well, I have got to ask you this. All right. I have heard all my life about the ghost in that old hospital, <laughs> about the nurse that walks and her feet are beneath the floor right. and all right. this. Did you ever hear about those stories oh, when you were young? yes. And the nurse that walked was Mrs. Smith. Her uh, her husband was Dr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith and Dr. Clark ran the hospital when it was in that building I was talking mm -hmm. about that was Sid Cottingham's mm -hmm. building now. Uh, they were in charge of that hospital. They opened that hospital and ran it. And Dr. Smith's wife uh, was a nurse, and she was in charge of the nurses at that ah. hospital. And so they said after uh, the Board of Education took it over, mm -hmm. After the hospital closed, some years went by, and then the Board of Education took it over. And they said that uh, at night, Ms. Smith was walking the floor looking after those nurses and calling their names and really getting them <laughs> told about what they should and shouldn't do. And people claimed that they really saw that. Julian, uh, what was his name? Julian Williams. Williams. Mm -hmm. He said that when he was there uh, working with the Board of Education, he went back at night, that he had several ghost tales to tell about <laughs> seeing Miss Smith. <laughs> when my daddy was on the Board of Education and they'd have a meeting at night, I would beg him to let me go <laughs> see if I could see the ghost. And he'd always say, I didn't have any business in town at night. So I, I've always heard those. I didn't know how far they went back. Um, tell me a little bit about, I, I heard that um, some of the doctor's offices well, Dr. Jardine and Dr. Stapleton's... Well, that was much later. That was much later. Was that in the 50s or...? Uh, I would imagine 40s and 50s. Okay. Or, uh, as well as I remember. I didn't know how old that building was, because that's, yeah. that's a spooky building. You know, our medical uh, uh, industry certainly changed. When I was a child coming up, 
uh, my mother would go to the phone and call the doctor and say, my, my daughter's running a high temperature, can you check by here? And the doctor would come to the house and take care of the child. Mm -hmm. And of course, mother said by the time the doctor got there, we were usually out in the yard playing. <laughs> I bet you have seen a lot of changes in health yes, over 93 years. Absolutely. Your tonsillectomy, do you remember anything about it and how you felt <laughs> I, afterwards? I remember that uh, I got ice cream afterwards, and that was the only thing I could eat, and I just <laughs> loved getting that ice cream. I remember getting the ice cream and eating the ice cream afterwards. The highlight of the show? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. That's right. wonderful. Um, for those of you who do not know, Miss. Scott was a tanner, right. and all the tanners, I'm, she, I don't think there's one in the world she's not related to, but uh, when did you move to Douglas? Were you born in Douglas? Or? I was born in Douglas. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was here whenever the county was organized, uh, way back in, uh, what was it, 1854, mm -hmm. the county was organized, and my great-great-grandfather Barry Hampton County, another Barry Hampton County, was an elected sheriff of the county when it was first organized. Mm -hmm. And then my uh, great-grandfather, Elijah Towner, uh, was representative to the Georgia legislature. And there's a real funny story about him that the family tells. Uh, that was during the time whenever the populist party, political party, Mm -hmm. was uh, coming into existence. The farmers felt like that the Democrats had not taken good care of them. And so they formed a party here in the South that was called the Populist Party. And that was, um, uh, we didn't have Republicans back then. We just had Democrats and the Populists. <laughs> so the Populist Party became very popular with the farmers. And one of the things that um, uh, distinguished the party was the farmers wore those large, tall black hats, black wool hats with the big brim all the way around them. I don't know if you've ever seen them or you remember. I've seen them in right? pictures. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what they wore. All the farmers wore those big black hats, and they were called the wool hat boys, but the populist party. If you were a member of the party and you were a farmer, you had that black wool hat, you would call the wool hat boys. So my grandfather, my great-grandfather, wore that black wool hat all the time. And when he finally uh, was elected, well, the night that he was elected, the ballot box burned. Uh -oh. Now, we don't know how the ballot <laughs> box burned, know what happened or why it burned, but the night he was elected, the ballot box burned. And so he was not able to prove, you know, that he had been elected. So it was quite a while they had to go to court and the court had to take up the case and listen to all of the evidence. And finally, it was decided that he had won. The Populist Party had won. So he got on the train and went to it for the legislation session. But it was a, he was a year before he could get there. Well, he was so proud of being there, he had his black wool hat on. <laughs> and he walked into the legislature session with his black wool hat on and sat down. They sent somebody back there to tell him, that Mr. Towner, you need to take your hat off. <laughs> and he said, nope, not going to do it. This is my symbol right here, Populist Party. He wouldn't take his hat off. So finally, the chairman or whoever it was that was in charge went back and asked him again, and he refused to take his hat off. So they went back and they said, well, what are we going to do? So they said, I know. We'll pass a rule that Mr. Towner from Coffee County can keep his hat on during the legislature session. <laughs> he got his way after he got all. His way. That's a wonderful story. Mary Clyde, I thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see what you tell us next month. Oh, I'm glad I, to I, be here. I just love your stories. We'll be back in just a moment. Um, I've got about four hours, but we're not going to watch all of them. Uh, I would like to thank y'all for coming today and that in April, I guess, Johnny, I've been working for this for about three years. Urban renewal destroyed Rat Row. They, the buildings were demolished. They gave them $5,000 to build somewhere else. In the 60s, about the same time integration took place. I have a 102-year-old lady and one that's 
90, close to it, coming next month to talk to us about all the businesses on Rat Road or Cherry Street. And I am so excited because everything I have found, they had a black chamber of commerce, they had all these things down there in their community, and it was all moved to one block across from Carver School with urban renewal. Huh? The, the town, the businesses were all moved to a cross from what is now the ninth grade academy, that little shopping center, and Ward Welchel built those buildings. But their business, there's their hotels, their restaurants, their barbershops, everything was destroyed and they were moved out and once you destroy a town, it's gone. So there were some bad with urban renewal and one of the worst things for that community was it happened at the same time of school integration. And just to set the record straight, the only community that lost their school during integration was Carver. That community lost their school. Uh, nobody else did, but their school that was K through 12, and that school was their community. Everything happened around that school was gone. So you had two killing blows on a small community at one time. And I'm so excited to get them here finally to come and talk about this. So I sure hope y'all come see it because it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I just know it. Yes, it's the fourth Wednesday in April. We do it the fourth Wednesday of every month except November and December. And every month is something different. And if you have any ideas, we'll be glad to take them and hunt somebody to talk about them. Please don't make them boring people, but well, you know. <laughs> Some people can't talk. Some people are shy. So they need to have like this and we don't need that. We can't hear it. I can't hear it anyway. I also have up here some paper and pen before you leave, if you have an anecdote or a little story or in, in something like that about Mary Clyde, I would love for you to write it down and sign it. I got several pens and several pieces of paper. You can put two or three on a paper. I don't care. Uh, we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to get memories of her because I think she's she's going to be a jewel. That in 50 years, when somebody comes to do research, that's the one they're going to go get to. That's the one they'll get to. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you come back next week. Thank you. Next month, excuse me. <laughs> don't, not next week. Please don't come next week. <laughs> thank you all very much.